everybody. It's October 11th, and this is episode 44 of the About to Break podcast. It's your favorite program, the one where we sit down with artists and entertainers and talk about the ups and downs of life in the entertainment business. I will say again, if you're just joining us, this is not a how-to guide. This is not how to break into the industry, although there's a lot of helpful tips along the way. This podcast is really just solidarity for the journey. It's how to not let the industry break you while you're trying to break into it. That's really what it is. And I've been so encouraged by each of these episodes and all the great artists we've talked to. And I've been highly encouraged by all of you who are going on iTunes and Google Play and rating and reviewing the show. I can't tell you how many comments and emails and private messages I've gotten uh, from individuals who have found this program because of those reviews. They were scrolling along and they went, hey, what is this? This looks interesting. And they gave it a go because you told them you like the show. So thank you to everyone who's already done that. If you haven't taken a second yet to do that and you have your phone with you, would you do me a favor? If you're in the podcast app there on uh, on Apple, on iTunes, all you got to do is click and give us a little five-star review. If you like the show, tell us a little bit of what, about what you like about it. Uh, we Right now, we have 33 reviews, which is just incredible to me. All of them are five stars. So it's exciting, but it's also kind of nerve-wracking because at some point, I know we're going to get a negative review, and that's okay. But right now, they're all five stars. It's like we've got that new shiny pair of shoes, and at some point, it'll get dirty. But thank you to everyone who's given us those five-star reviews. Thank you to everyone who's telling their friends and sharing it. And uh, if you could go right now, leave us a little note. Let us know what you think about the podcast. Put the note there on iTunes. Give us a five-star review. It makes all the difference in the world. I, uh, I have kind of a personal goal. I want to have one review for every podcast that we put out. That's it. Just one review for every episode we put out. Right now, we've got 33 reviews, which is incredible. Uh, but we're at 44 episodes. So I need 11 people who could help me out. Just go on there, click on it, give it a review. Uh, let us know what you think about the show. It really does make all the difference in the world. And it's really encouraging as I'm sitting in the closet at my house recording this intro to think that maybe someone else is going to hear this. So you have no idea how encouraging those notes are to get. Thank you again for everyone who's rating and reviewing the show. The gentleman that I have on the show this week is so dynamic and so versatile that I didn't know what to put in the description. Uh, He is a motivational speaker. He is an author. He was a Paralympian. Uh, He does stand-up comedy, guys. I, I can't believe it. I saw Josh Sundquist first at Adam Grabowski's Grab Bag Show. I was performing a set, and I saw him come out, and he did his thing, and it was hilarious. It was so funny. And it was encouraging and it was motivating. And then I sat down with him to record this episode and it was all of those things times 10. He's such an incredible individual, such a great human being. And I know that you're going to love him. Sit back, relax, and enjoy episode 44, my conversation with Josh Sundquist. No, I'm not a writer. Okay. Something is about to break. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to About to Break. I'm your host, Taylor Hughes, and this week I am joined with my new friend, Josh Sunquist. Thanks for having me, Taylor. Thank you for thank you for having me. <laughs> we are in uh, your hometown, Santa Monica here. Yeah. In, uh, in a lovely office that you arranged. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, I did, I did minimal work. My, my wife arranged it by That's becoming awesome. employed here. <laughs> I, I uh, always, people ask me, where do you record? And I just say, wherever you're at. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, unless you want to drive to Upland. Which yeah, is, I appreciate you making the drive here. Yeah, <laughs> thank, thank you. And we're drinking Phil's coffee. Delightful. This, this was a special treat this morning because I love Phil's. It's it's like a Bay Area thing. Yeah, it is. And then it's just recently come to SoCal. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's amazing. I, I just moved to Los Angeles last year. And before that, I had never had, I guess you'd call like individually brewed coffee you know like where they do like what they do there with one cup and i was just like whoa like game changing yeah i'm like i am instantly a coffee snob (laughs) isn't it all you know like i just like instantly like i even like when i go to coffee shops now yeah i just sound like the worst human being because i'll be like um do you do you individually drip your coffee and i did this actually in the bay area i was visiting my brother like two months ago (laughs) and i went to this very like fancy coffee and i was like um, do you do individually dripped coffee? Yeah. And the guy, they didn't, but the guy was like super defensive and way more <laughs> coffee knowledge. He was like, 
Uh, no, we don't, but uh, that's actually a myth that that tastes better. It's actually more about the quality of the beans and the temperature at which the water, and he went into this oh, whole wow. thing. Oh, wow, he went into And I was it. like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll have a cup of that, sure. <laughs> I wonder if it, like some of it has to do with like how individual we're getting, you know, that what's like, yeah, I don't even it want, feel I don't want my coffee in the same batch with everyone else's yeah, yeah. coffee. I, want, like, I watched that be made for me. <laughs> it I'm is sorry. good though. Yeah. It's delicious. It's so stinking good. And, uh, yeah, they also, Phil's is interesting because they don't, they don't have a espresso machine, like no espresso, but they make yeah. all the drinks. Yeah. They do it I all. I about that. Yeah. Right. They don't, there's, they do it all pour over and. And they pour it cool, like all yeah, Tom Cruise like, cocktail style. Like, yeah, it's, it's very uh, very boomerang friendly. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, not just Instagram, specifically, <laughs> specifically animated yeah. looping. That's why I hear Phil's Coffee is why they invented boomerang. Yeah. So that we could, we could <laughs> specifically it. for them. Well, man, uh, this is kind of fun that we're in Santa Monica because we met a few months ago in yeah, Santa Monica. Yeah. You live here. And uh, Adam Grabowski, who I had on the show recently, nice. he puts on this cool show yeah. called Grab Bag, where he basically gets a grab bag of variety entertainment and has guys come out. And I met you that night, and I was telling you this a little bit before we started recording, but I saw you do stand-up, and you're freaking hilarious. Thank you. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to go check out more of Josh's stand-up. And I go, and I, I Google you, and I'm like... Holy crap, he's done everything. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, Paralympic and like author and keynote speaker. And well, I'm glad you had the reaction of being impressed rather than being like, wait, he's not a stand up. No. <laughs> like, he's a fraud. Oh, do you get, you he get, doesn't do stand up at all. What did so, I see? Who was that? Was that even the same guy? <laughs> so, man, there is kind of an attitude sometimes, you know, the purest attitude of like, unless you only do this one thing. You yeah, ever, you ever get that vibe from people? Um, I, yeah, I guess. Uh, I don't know. I feel like it's kind of it could be boring to do one thing. Also, as a self-employed <laughs> entertainer, it's it's very I think dangerous or right. it, it sounds scary to me if if you only do one thing really right. specific because like what if that niche dries up? So I really like yeah. having like a couple niches. Yep. And I guess also like you were saying with this podcast, you know, when, when your job involves traveling to a place to entertain people yep. where I would say my primary job is doing that as a motivational speaker, right. you end up with these kind of busy seasons and then these sort of like downtimes where you're like, you're at home, you're, you're caught up on all your phone calls and contracts <laughs> yeah. and invoices. And you're like, now what am I going to do all day? Right. And so I guess I like to find things that can fill in those holes and, and, and be sort of tangential or maybe like part of my job, but it's not necessarily like the career. So yeah. for me that at different times has been writing books or uh, doing like a lot, you know, different types of online video that yeah. can be very time consuming. And then, yeah, recently it's been just like stand up comedy. I guess, yeah, a, a couple things happened. I did, I did a little stand up like 10 years ago when I lived in DC, just op okay. like open mics. Did you grow up in DC? I grew up in Virginia. Okay. And then moved to like the Northern Virginia area after college. Yeah. And so I did some open mics and yeah, they were just like, you know, open mics. Like, yeah, were I just kind of got burned out on it. Uh, did you have like, were these like bringer shows? Like, where friends come out and see you do stuff? Or were these just a room just, like, full of go comics? Go sign up and looking perform for open. like, yeah, the the other eight comics who have that heard, not who heard this, at all. this material yesterday yes. and the day before at the other yep. open mics. Yeah, and so I, I just didn't, it just wasn't that fun, I guess. Yeah. And then uh, I didn't really, like, I've been a huge fan of stand-up for a long, you know, forever, basically. Yeah. And then a few months ago, basically, it happened that I, I discovered West Side Comedy. Like, I just mm. didn't, I didn't know it was there. I'd lived here almost a year, and I just saw it, and I was like, whoa, there's a comedy theater. Like a couple blocks like, from your house. Yeah, like, yeah. within a pro eight minute walk, maybe. Like, it's, yeah. it's like five blocks. And so I was like, this is awesome. So I, both, I just started going there as a an audience member yeah. with the idea like maybe someday I would be able to perform here yeah. but so I was going there several times a week and then it was through Adam like I went to uh, one of the grab bags and afterwards I was just I was talking to him not in a sense like oh I want to be in your show I was just asking him about his the way he works his travel schedule I think it was some yeah. kind of like yeah. in technical like self-employed entertainers sort right. of question We're just <laughs> which it came up that I was a motivational speaker and he was like oh you're a motivational speaker like I like my show to be very, like, when yeah. I say variety, 
maybe yeah. you can come do some inspirational speaking. Yeah. And I was like, okay. But in my mind, I was like, I'm going to do some stand. It's definitely going to be <laughs> yeah. like, it might be stuff, you know, like there is some material that can work both, I think in stand up right. and in motivational speaking. Uh, not all of it. Right. But, but to the extent that I'm going to, yeah, I could do material for my speeches, but Here's the way I would say it, actually. Sometimes there could be something that could work in both, that the, the, the comedic sensibility is it's, it's, uh, it's light enough for like a corporate audience, but right. funny enough for a Comedy, stand-up yeah. theater. Yep. The difference is if I'm giving a speech that after the bit, there's like an application of it. Yeah. Like what you do with the Rubik's Cube, <laughs> yeah. right? It's We're, exactly yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, and exactly yeah. like what you were saying about like when you're in a comedy theater, you're like, oh, I probably shouldn't do yep. the inspirational bit. That's exactly what it is for me. It's like I, I might have a funny bit and and then in a, in a corporate speech at the end, I'll be like, and, uh, you know, I, I guess this has not come up so far in our yeah. interview, but it is relevant for your listeners to know at this point that I have one leg. So in a corporate event, I might do like a bit about having one leg jokes. And then at the end I can be like, and you know, like you might, uh, having one leg is not a thing you would probably expect me to find humor in. And right. like, I don't mean to make it sound like a positive thing. It's like, I don't want to have one leg. I don't recommend it or anything like that. Yeah. But if this is the situation I'm in, I can't change it. And so for me, it's like, why not find humor yeah. in it? And so for you, in whatever your life situation is, you probably have problems, things that you can't change. And maybe there's like humor that you can find within those two. Yeah. Right? So that's like a serious application. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't do that in a comedy club, yeah. but I could use the same joke setup. Yeah, right? that's true. Yeah. So, yeah. So then uh, that was how uh, I got, I met Adam. And then I think the show we met was the second grab bag that I performed in. Because you've which, done like the last which three was, of them, right? Yeah, so, but that was basically, that was my second time ever performing like in a comedy club. That's like proper, crazy. Proper comedy. Well, and th- that's crazy. And th- yeah, well, but you've been motivational speaking for how long? Yeah, a long time. So it's, it's, you know, it's and, not like I, yeah, it is like I've never performed in a comedy club, but I've been giving speeches since I was 10 years old. Yeah. So oh, yeah. for over 20 years. So, totally. the, you know, to the extent that that being a stand-up or a magician is based on being comfortable in front of people, being able right. to hold people's attention. Like right. I do, I have developed that skill over time. Yeah. So, uh, and, and to me, that's half, at least half the battle in comedy, yeah. right? It's because it doesn't matter how funny your jokes are. Yep. If you can't hold people's attention and also speak them articulately, right. it just, it literally doesn't matter because people's minds are wandering. Totally. So there's kind of those two pieces, I would say, because I'm not super experienced as a stand-up, like my strength is more the former, like being able to hold people's attention and speak articulately. Yeah. And and now uh, now that stand-up is my my new like side hustle, I guess. <laughs> that I need to. I'm like work now. I'm like working on my material. And, like, love it. My, yes, love work, it. Yeah. It's 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 very um, it's very addicting. I find. I mean, the not in a negative way. Yeah. But, you know, being a magician and having performed for years and years using props, I've always looked at guys, whether it's motivational speaking or stand up, that walk up, have a mic, <laughs> yeah. and, and that's it. Yeah, that's the and whole show. And can hold an audience. Yeah. And I just think that's fantastic. Yeah, that, I, yeah, I get that. I mean, and because you're, the times I've seen you, it's not even been a huge prop, but yeah, you have the big yeah. Mary Poppins bag. Right. <laughs> Gotta drag that thing around. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, set up, and all, it's over- set up a bunch of stuff beforehand. <laughs> yeah, I I joked with uh, with Adam, but we we do a we do a show uh, monthly at Nerd Melt on Sunset that is um it's called Jokers and Aces, and so I oh, have yeah, three yeah. stand ups and three comedians. You run that show? Uh huh. Yeah, no yeah. Way. I've, I've like uh, I don't know. I've seen it around. I feel like I always. I see it on lots of people's like Twitter and stuff. Oh, cool, man! I've always been like, cool. Oh, well, I've always been like, that's a great name. For, yeah, for, for it's a really great yeah, name. Yeah. For oh, what man. I assume is like a, I guess it's like stand up and magic. It's, or, yeah, or it's just yeah. My buddy and I co-host it. He's a stand up, and then I I do stand up, but primarily I'm a magician. So I bring three magicians, guys from the castle, and he'll yeah. bring three stand ups oh, from the nice. comedy scene. And it's really really stinging fun. But I always laugh because the green room beforehand will be will be five minutes before the show, and there will be. Uh, three very well dressed magicians <laughs> who have yeah. been there for two hours setting up yeah, their yeah. little boxes. Yep. And the comics would literally roll in while you're introing them and then yeah. walk off and leave the room. <laughs> like, yeah. leave the building. No, totally. Yeah, and I feel like, yeah, I see that grab bag. Oh, yeah. It's like, <laughs> like yeah, people will have like actual trunks that they're going through the material. And the comics come in, they're like, what? Like, how long? And then they write a set list like on their hand right. in Sharpie. 
and, and walk yeah. on and do it. So yeah, it is it is very different in that sense. I used to or so, when I when I, I used to speak to teenagers a lot, like primarily when yeah. I was younger, and that's kind of how I got started. And I did a, a song at the end, and I would I would bring a guitar with me. Yeah. I was like, oh, this is awful. So then I was like. Well, how can I do this differently? So then I was like, I will play the song on a ukulele. Yes, I've and, done that same move. And, so people, and people are always like, that's so funny that you have a ukulele. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, you, it's, uh, yeah it's, it's really just a space just issue. For, it, fits it fits in, in a the, backpack. Yes. And it's so easy. But even that, I'm like, oh, man, it's so great when I do corporate gigs and I don't have to bring that oh, ukulele along. Oh, yeah. Mostly because I have so many conversations in airports where people are like, what instrument? They're yeah. like, people are like, is that a ukulele? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, how, like, how long you been playing? And I'm like, oh, I like, I actually only play one song. A hundred percent of the time, though, people are like, ha ha ha, that's Bro. hilarious. Like, they think I'm joking. They're like, oh, one song. Like, you must be great. I can see how humble you are. I don't no. know why the person in this story has a southern accent. And. <laughs> And so, uh, yeah, and, and so it's hard to persuade people. Like, no, like, I literally play one song. Yeah. It has three chords. Yes. And I, I modify oh, the ukulele so gosh. that an open strum is the main is chord the of main the song. Chord. You are speaking my language. I literally, in the last six months, I was traveling with a guitar for one piece in my show. Yeah. And I said, this is just... It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Like that I'm doing. The, yeah. And, and it so, was a, it's, it's so big. And it was a bit that I like really what at the time needed to do this bit. Mm-hmm. So I, I seriously went while I was on a, a corporate retreat. I went and I bought a ukulele at Guitar Center and learned how to play it. And then that was the last time I brought the guitar. That's awesome. But yeah, same move, man. Just not because it was a better deal. Not because it was, a, you know, it was just portability. <laughs> yeah. And it works fine. It is like novel. It is. People have seen guitars a lot. Yeah. So there's there's something in that. But yeah, mostly it's just, it's easy. And so yeah, so I totally get, I totally get what you're saying with the props. That's a, that's a really interesting observation. Yeah. And in, in that sense, yeah, I mean, stand up is especially is, is entertainment in its purest form. You know, like yeah. a, lot of speaker, oh, yeah. a lot of speakers are very slide heavy uh, or rely a lot on video. Yeah. And that to me is similar to props. There's certain, we might say they're like virtual props. Right. Uh, and, and that can take a ton of preparation. I don't personally use slides at all or, yeah. or any video. Uh, and, but that's just a personal preference. But, you know, with, I would say stand up is the, is the one medium where there really is, it would be weird or, or it would be like a, a sort of an alt stand-up if you use slides right. or video. Oh, yeah. We'd kind of be like, why? This isn't stand-up. Now this is like a one-man show oh, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, well, in stand-up, uh, I've had a lot of comic friends kind of cr- criticize guys that will use, whether it's a guitar or mm-hmm. a flip chart or different things because it's, uh, you know... And I understand. Like, some people will say it's a shortcut. Like, if mm-hmm. I play a minor chord on the guitar, you feel sad. Yeah. I haven't said anything to compel you, you yeah. know? and But... At the end of the day, if it's funny, it's funny. Yeah, that's yeah, that's what I would say. It's like, okay, I can, yeah, you can define it however you want, but oh, yeah. like, does it make people laugh? Yeah. If so, then like, people just want to laugh. Like, uh, yes, it's so simple. I've had magicians argue with me over the type of microphone you should use. As like, what is what is pure magic? Like, or, or like, what is, what is the most pure form of magic stagecraft? For- I've had people. Be critical of folks that will use like a countryman, like a headset mic. Yeah. Um, and because they feel like, you know, a speaker needs to have a handheld mic huh. for dynamics and all of this. And then other guys are like, I can't work with a handheld mic because I need my hands yeah, so much. Yeah, it seems really hard for magic. Yeah. Like, I always, because so much of magic, like all of it, it's like <laughs> using your hands to move things. Yeah. So having one hand unavailable seems like that could be uh, a, a big disadvantage. Yeah, I've I've over and this is another thing within the past year or two that I've really spent time going back and reblocking tricks just oh, to be yeah. able to use a handheld. Yeah, cuz yeah, if you want to do because, Yeah, if you're going to do comedy clubs yeah. or I mean a lot of times even it, I'm amazed at how many nice corporate events are using the Credi Hotel PA and all yeah. they have is a mic on yeah. the stand. So um, yeah, it's just you know, one of those things that I think is good to be able to do if you need to. But yeah, and that's but that's maybe the most interesting challenge of stand up to me actually is that I I walk with crutches, so I can't I uh, well I can't easily walk around and hold a microphone right. at the same time. Yeah, I can, yeah. but I think that well. Uh, I don't want to know how many like levels of a- analysis and permutation I want to go into. No, do it, do it. Okay, so. Um, 
what I what I have been trying to figure out in the three to four times I've done stand up in yeah. my life ever is when people see me on the street or whatever they there is a um, a response for a lot of people like oh like that guy's life must be so sad like he has one leg oh man and 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 then they have weird conversations with me which eventually becomes comedy bits but <laughs> in a th- comedy show I I feel like I have that same response from some audience members. Mm. And so I have to figure out how to teach them that I am not sad. Like I, I'm not like, I'm not here out of bitterness or sadness about my situation. I'm actually here because like, I'm pretty, I'm pretty much fine with it. Yeah. And, and so I say like, why not find jokes in it? And so I, and, Mm. and I think some people then it takes them a few minutes to realize that. Yeah. So I'm trying to figure out then how can I either, Either, maybe it's a maybe it's saying that explicitly. Maybe there's a bit about that about like I know yeah, right now you right. like this is what you're thinking about me and, and like and then maybe that's a joke, but that also communicates something. Or maybe it's like smiling more. Or maybe it's just I need to make sure I have at least five minute sets so I can get to that place. I don't know. Yeah. But the thing about the microphone is I can walk with a microphone in one crutch. I worry that when it, that it looks like a struggle when people see that, and oh. so then I, I feel like. Are they distracted by it? It's like it's not really that much of a struggle, but I can see a people like, oh man, yeah, like is it that looks hard for him, and then they're not paying attention to the joke anymore. Well, you're also you're very physical with your performance. Yeah, you know, like I my thought was not, oh, that guy's not doing well. My thought was, why am I a fat lazy? <laughs> like, I need to go freaking work out because I, yeah. I mean you do things on stage that I wouldn't be comfortable doing you know yeah maneuvering and like Thank you <laughs> yeah and so I guess when I when I give a speech that is the one my AV rider is it is one one item and it is I need a microphone right. that is not a handheld like yeah. I need a lavalier or, or a, a headset, headset yeah because I can't move around otherwise and to like yeah. hold people's attention for an hour with a handheld you know, then it's just, it, it becomes, it's almost impossible. I think if it's just on a, on a mic stand, yeah. because for me, a big part of holding people's attention and like as a speaker, especially like being able to project energy is yeah. through big movements. Right. And as a person walking on crutches, I, I need to have my hands free to be able to gesture and to be able to walk. It's like, yeah. I can do it's, I can do like two of the three, right. Which yep. I can, I can walk, I can gesture or I can hold a microphone. I can't do all three at once. So if I can have the microphone on my shirt, then that, gets rid of that so ultimately yeah i think if i was to be like headlining a comedy club i'd feel comfortable bringing my own microphone yep the way a lot of like magicians do uh actually <laughs> in the mary poppins bag yeah and and just saying like <laughs> hey i need my own but i don't want to uh, you know i don't feel like i bring that any kind of cachet right now into a comedy club I no don't not at all anno- Dude, well, i don't no want to be like annoying with the microphone i know it would, people would be like fine but i just don't want like yeah that complication so right now i'm just trying to figure out cool well, if i'm doing a short set yeah. In a comedy show, I need to just be comfortable using a mic. And like, so sometimes I'll take it out if, it, if it's really important for that bit. For the most part, I just kind of put it, leave it there and try yeah. to like move around. And if I'm, if I move off the mic, just project really loud. There's, you know, there, I don't, I don't think the mic's an issue. I don't think, I mean, I think it's good to think through these things, but I don't think anybody is seeing you perform and worrying about how <laughs> oh, he's using a handheld or, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Or he's using a headset. Like. I, I I think some of it might be in the comedy club. Most comics come from this perspective of depression or totally. my life is awful. Yeah. I mean, and sadly, like offstage, so many entertainers in general, but comics do struggle with, you know, you're on stage giving people this experience that you haven't necessarily experienced yourself yeah. of joy, you know? Yeah, yeah. Comics are... Uh, often a very grumpy lot. Yeah. So it might be, I'm just saying in a comedy club, having, having you come up and being highly positive in, it, it might come across like, how is he happy? Like, yeah, <laughs> if none of these other yeah. guys are happy, maybe, maybe it's the and opposite. He's happy. <laughs> maybe it's the opposite. Maybe people are like not sitting there like, Oh, he seemed, he's probably really sad. Maybe they're, maybe they're like, he's too happy. Yeah. I don't, I don't, like-, <laughs> I don't like him. <laughs> How can he be happy? Yeah. He has half as many legs as I do. I resent that. So maybe it's the opposite. Maybe I do need to come up and be sad for a while <laughs> at the start of my set. You should just come out and just say. Just say what people are probably thinking. 
That yeah. might be, you know what I mean? That might be yeah, yeah, just, just kind like of an internal monologue. Yeah, internal yeah. monologue and just look around the room. And yeah. Cause they, and of course, like the first question people always have is, is how I lost my leg. So I know that's very they much might, on their people, minds. Yeah. People, and yeah. so, so that's what, a lot of times I'll open with, uh, like a bit I do that you've heard about wh- that, that people quite often, especially when my hair is shorter, like it is right now, assume that I lost my leg in a rock. And so I know, I know a lot of audience members yeah. I, are, must be assuming that because people do in real life. Yeah. So that's why it's a nice bit to do right at the start because mm-hmm. it does, like, like you do when you, at the start where you're like, I'm like uh, Alec Baldwin, Mary Poppins. Oh, yeah, right? yeah, Because yeah. it's like, that's what's on people's mind and you hit it. It's a, yeah. it's a great opener. <laughs> so I, I think then, yeah, acknowledging, you probably think that I lost my leg in a rock. Is, it works mm-hmm. nicely. But maybe there's a way, yeah, where it's, it's, it's more even just direct like, that sort of, you know, like Jim Gaffigan does that like audience. Oh yeah, stuff. totally. Yeah. And so maybe it's just like, what? Oh, that think? man has one leg. Yeah. He's probably really sad. Yeah. Like, uh, I wonder if he lost his leg in a rock. I or yeah. He looks like be. the guy from Cloudy with the Chance of Meatballs. <laughs> Dude, when you said that, I was like, ah. Oh, Thanks. Yeah, that, that's my Alec Baldwin. <laughs> that's my Alec Baldwin. Uh, yeah. So yeah, maybe there's something like that. Or yeah, I, w- I want to do. I'm trying to work out a joke that's that's like a. Uh, like a misdirection. I'm really bad at misdirection jokes okay. because I hate lying and I feel like I'm lying. I feel like the setup because it's, it's made yeah. to deceive you. Right. I feel like I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, that's funny. I'm so sorry. Just wait for the punchline. Yeah. Uh, and, and definitely as, as a motivational speaker, you know, um, people believing that everything I say is true is, is essential to how I make my living. So right. I don't, like when I do comedy bits or when I do stories, They've they're never like made up stories. Truth. They're real. Like these are things that actually happen to me. Mm. So, uh, so that's just kind of like what I'm used to on yeah. stage, but I want to do anyway, uh, some, something like combining those things, like, uh, like, uh, you know, pe- people often stare at me and, 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 and I get it. Like, I know that you have to stare when you see a guy who looks this much like the dude from Claudia with a chance oh, of meatballs. Funny. Right. Cause I, I want to yeah, like yeah, push yeah. people into the, yeah, they're staring cause he has one leg yeah. and then they're like, Oh yeah, there's another thing about them. Yeah, it's yeah, not yeah, just yeah. that he has one leg. Oh yeah. So I'm trying to, I'm working on that. That's great. I'll take submissions if, if you, think oh, yeah, yeah, we'll, if you or your listeners think of some good, uh, some good openers for me. Some oh good, man. Some good we'll misdirections. It. Right. <laughs> it, magic and comedy do have a, a similarity in that you're kind of holding back something, you know, like in magic, there's this, the, 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 the reveal is the thing that, you know, you've always got this thing in your back pocket they don't know about. Mm -hmm. And with comedy, it's, you've got the punchline, you know, where you're withholding something so that when you give it to somebody, it's, It's you know, yeah. Yeah. You're totally, it's, it's interesting. I've never thought of it that way. And I mean, it's, it's clearly an analogous art form because Mm -hmm the response can be the same. Mm -hmm. People laugh. Like people will laugh, like myself included, when you see a great trick. Yeah. It's not, it's not funny per se, but it's just that like tension, you know, I think, I think biologically sometimes why we laugh is to release tension. Yeah. And, and then in a joke, it could be the, the tension between the truth of the joke and the exaggeration of it. Yeah. In magic, it's the, what I'm seeing with my eyes and what I know the laws of physics say. Uh, Right. And there's that tension. So you just, you laugh. Yeah. And yeah, you're right. It's like a similar kind of setup surprise. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes people come into the room with all this tension they built up because we take everything so seriously Yeah, that I think, you know, and that's a lot of when you're up there and you're, when, when, whoever's up there, the self-deprecating thing of like taking what you do seriously, but not taking yourself too seriously. Mm -hmm. It allows people to go, ah, like, you know, yeah, I I just, I feel like that. I think we're tense most of the time. <laughs> no, I think that's absolutely true. And I think, yeah, I feel like to me, the greatest gift I can give people, eh, I, don't, I don't know if that's true. I would say like the gift that I most want to be able to give people yeah. is a moment of delight that interrupts the story that you're telling yourself oh, about your good, day or your man. life or your problems. Yeah, And so, and I think of that, all the like from an hour long speech where maybe for a lot of that hour I can take you out of your your story or your problems and yeah. and share my story which hopefully in a, in a speech then becomes a metaphor for your story when you go back to it afterwards right but all the way to you know uh, have you, you seen my Halloween costumes mm-hmm. uh, yeah yes so oh, yeah. so I fantastic. do these these like funny ish Halloween costumes they're fantastic <laughs> thank you and. And I have a similar goal there. It's, you know, it's not, I'm not going to hold your attention for an hour. It's going to be like three seconds. Yeah. But what I'm hoping is when you see that for a moment, it's that kind of like, 
oh, like that, it's so it's so unexpected to see yeah. a costume that you can't quite figure it out and then you figure out that I have one leg and that's how I'm able to make that shape yeah. that, it, that maybe it interrupts that pattern that you have about like oh I'm, uh, my, my bills and my problems yeah. and I'm sad and here's what I'm trying to do tomorrow and 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 I think then that's I, to me it's like that's what all like art hopefully does or yes. movies or entertainment it, it takes you out of your problems like gives you a yeah. sort of a break Josh I love that you're sharing that because I would say in almost all art forms, but especially in comedy, we can have this idea of, I'm going to go get something from this audience. I'm mm-hmm. going to get them to laugh. Yeah. And if they don't laugh, then they're a bad audience and it was a terrible room or whatever, right? But you're approaching it with, I want to give people an opportunity to laugh, which is all the difference in the world. Yeah. Or I want to give people the opportunity to reflect on their life or to consider something they haven't before. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, you know, I thought maybe six months ago it occurred to me that I had, when I looked at the things that I had been into as sort of hobbies and professionally, that is being sort of a, a YouTuber and vlogger and giving motivational speeches and, yeah. and writing my books, I was kind of thought, oh, you know, I, I'm, I like to perform. Like I'm a performer. Yeah. And then, but that didn't always quite sit right with me. And then about six months ago, I realized, no, it's, I'm not a performer. I'm an entertainer. Mm. And think about the difference of the connotation there. Performer is like, it's it's about me, I feel like. It's like, I am the performer here Uh, to like, you know, to gratify my ego in in what I want to perform for you. Whereas I feel like entertainer is like, I'm here to entertain you. It's about, it's about them. It's not about the person on stage. Yeah. And of course, I mean, that's, it's semantics and just the connotations. No, no, but it's huge. I mean, even personally, when I think about it now, I like to think of, I'm entertaining people rather than I'm like performing to feel good about myself or yeah. feel affirmed. Of course, there's there's always ego in it, and of course, I want to feel good about myself, etc. Right. But I but I like I like that distinction, and and yeah, it, it feels right to me to describe it that way as an. That's really cool because even using the term performer, then the the immediate word that comes to mind is audience, which is a passive. They're just seeing you do the thing that you do and clapping for you because yeah. you're great at it versus. The ex, you know, like you said, an entertainer, and then the people being entertained. It's their experience. It really is. Yeah, and the, and the it's other- not just semantics, man. That makes all the difference in the world. Because when when I meet friends that are struggling with depression through performance, it's because they're not getting something that they want to get. Yeah. Versus this attitude of, hey, I could actually, you know, give somebody something. Yeah. To me through pre- presentation. Yeah, and the other distinction between the two words to me is if we say removed from sort of a professional entertainment kind of person, if we say, um, yeah, I had, I had lunch with that person, but like they were just putting on a performance. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? It means they're, they're fake, disingenuous, right? They were, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They're disingenuous. They weren't real. Yep. They were, they were trying to create a facade. Right. And so not, yeah. So again, it's, it's kind of like just the meaning behind the word, but it's like, yeah, like I don't want to say, I'm a performer when I give a motivational speech because if someone walked away from the motivational speech saying that was a performance, they mean that pejoratively. Like that's a negative thing. Yeah. Um, Whereas if they say like that was entertaining, that, that to me means like they, they received something from it and, and probably that it, that it had, I feel like good entertainment has to come from some, some kind of honest place as opposed to like, I'm, I'm faking you out with my, like my performance you know, the, okay, going, I feel like I've talked about magic too much in this, but going back to magic, how many times, well, I don't know if you've experienced this, but I, I have friends who will go on a cruise ship and they'll be like, oh, we saw this magician and he did this, this, and this, and it was that. Great. What was his name? I don't know. Yeah. And they don't, they don't remember the person because they didn't get, they didn't see the person. Hmm. They saw an act. They That's saw a show. Yeah. That that piece of, of being genuine and, and vulnerable and sharing appropriately a piece of yourself with an audience, I think is how people really connect to you as an individual, as opposed to just another guy doing playing a song on the guitar or doing yeah. a magic actor. That's an interesting distinction. And do you think is that um is that more common for magicians as far as People who do things on stage that that you walk away remembering the tricks rather than the name or the person? I think so. Yeah. Because I think most 
uh, I think most magicians are so focused on just doing the trick. Uh-huh. Like, they'll get in their mind, I want to do this effect. And yeah. it's all about that and all the yeah. attentions on it. Or you see a big stage show with illusions, which I love watching. But mm-hmm. a lot of times it's a guy pointing at a box and something happens with the box. And what happens? People walk away talking about, this guy had this box. box. Yeah, yeah. The box was magic. Yeah. You know? That's interesting. Yeah. I think to me, as just a lay fan of yeah. uh, of magic, I, it, it seems... Like I've seen, a, like I said, a, a lot of magic this summer. Uh, I at, love it because you just magic you, you've like here binged magic. Yeah, I've, I've seen like like fifty or sixty <laughs> magicians. So I've seen you know enough enough of them that uh, a lot of times I'll recognize a trick. Right. Like oh, this is Chinese rings. Or this right. Is, this is that one. Or, yeah, yeah, know, yeah. The rope or whatever. So that's you know I don't necessarily have a problem with it, but what I notice then is what I am watching for then is how. How? What is the personality yeah. that they bring to this? Like, what's the sensibility that this magician brings? Right. Because if they're a fun person to watch, yeah, I, I'll watch Magic Rings a million times. Yeah, like, do you? Um, uh, do you know this guy? What's his, what does he go by? Uh, Doc Hayden? Is yeah, that yeah. Oh, yeah. Pop Hayden. Pop Hayden. Pop, Pop Hayden. Hayden. Yeah. Uh, have you ever seen him do oh, the yeah. rings? Yeah, he's yeah. He's so, so, it's good. so good at it. And yeah. it's and he does do the rings as far as. Um, execution, I think, exceptionally well, and uses more rings right. and, and everything. But but and that's part of it, and that's always, of course, part of the trick. Like it's not like you can be a bad illusionist, right. and then everyone will remember your name. Right. But it's it's the it's the 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 essence that he yeah. brings oh, yeah, to yeah, the yeah. stage, right? It's just it's that that wry sense of humor that he has, yeah. and and you just sense like. Although he is uh, has created this sort of character for himself, like you just sense, like this is him, like this mm-hmm. is this is the, his essential form of humor, and and that's what makes him so memorable. And I've seen him several times, yeah. He's and great. I don't I don't roll my eyes when he brings out the rings. Like, oh, oh no. here's more rings. I'm like, yeah. cool. I, I love I love when he does this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the way how that's he great. how he does it, and then he's like pretends to tell you how it works. He's like, yeah, it's stupid once you know how it works. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I I had two routines uh, that I took out of my show this year. That I've been doing for years and years and years, and and the reason the reason I took them out, and I had this conversation with my wife and with some other magician friends, the reason I took them out is because they utilized props that are prevalent in magic shows, mm. and so kind of like what you're talking about with Doc and his ring routine is amazing. It's yeah, you shouldn't change a thing about it. But one of the challenges I find with magic is. I put all this time and story and personalization into it that the best part about that wasn't the trick. Uh huh. It, it was the jokes and it was the story and it was, you know, the time this happened as a kid and I'm telling the story using this illustration. And so I said, okay, how can I share all of that without a prop that people are going to go, oh, I've seen this before. Uh, interesting. Know? So, so that's, can, can I, you take that same take that same that thing. same story or whatever yeah. into a different trick? Yeah. Or or, or with with a different prop. Right. Is that what you're saying? That's yeah. interesting. And trying to, yeah. that, and it's just one of those things that I, and it probably ultimately doesn't matter. But to me, but the, it just where I'm at is I'm struggling with like, oh, I don't want people to walk away. I don't want them to be distracted by seeing a deck of cards and going, oh, I've seen the card trick. Yeah, you yeah. know, even though totally. there's millions. Yeah. But that's, I don't know, it's one of those weird things in magic. No, I think, I think that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, for, yeah, if people have seen a few magicians, yeah. then yeah, I think there can be a, a, like a, like I was saying, yeah, like, a, oh, I've seen this. So yeah, I think, I think that with a good stage presence, which yeah. I think like you have and like you're, like you bring so much energy and like have so many quick jokes you know, I think I think like you could do pr- like similar uh-huh. to Doc. Like you could do ordinary tricks, and I would still I would be like, yeah, I want to see <laughs> Taylor. Man. I want to see him do do the rings. I want to see him disappear a scarf and change the colors <laughs> or like whatever. Uh, I, like I'd, I'd still watch it, but yeah, you br- like there's a heightened element of interest when it's a Rubik's cube in a bottle, which mm-hmm. I've never seen before, combined with. Your personal sensibility, mm. right? That's that's probably the, the marriage oh, of the thanks, best of both man. worlds. Thanks, man. I I really just set up this whole conversation to get you to say that. No, <laughs> yeah, is, no but it, it, you you made me think about it because the fact that you walk on stage and you don't use you're not using pro presenter or PowerPoint or slides yeah. or video. 
that's a special thing. That's not, you know, some people would go like, oh, you don't have any slides? You know? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, totally. Like every meeting planner is like, just send me your slides. Yeah. I'm like, I don't have any. Yeah. And then I get there, like, oh, they're like, we don't have your slides yet. Yeah. What? And I'm like, oh, again, yeah, I yeah. actually don't have any. I, I mean, I've been to so many, uh, I, because I do MC stuff, I, I've seen so many different keynotes. I bet you've seen a lot. And yeah. I mean, so many. And some of them are just fantastic. But then there's always those ones where you go, I could have, you could have just emailed me this, these slides yeah. because all you're doing is reading the <laughs> yeah, slides. Yeah, totally. Like there's nothing. And they're getting paid for that. Yeah. Like the, the meeting planner like you know, hired them to come in and read geez. these slides. <laughs> like, wow, you must have a great brochure or something. <laughs> right. Or they're awesome a, website. Or they wrote a really good book. That yeah. They, or, yeah. Or they're famous or something. Yeah. And, and then they're bringing a sort of a different value. That's funny sometimes too. I mean, that's the difference with what you offer too. I mean, you are a, a best-selling author, but... A lot of times people think, oh, a best-selling author, he's going to be a great speaker. Not necessarily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, I think there's maybe a tiny correlation. Yeah. But it might not – it might be a negative correlation. <laughs> I don't know. Between – especially – I mean, especially maybe novelists. Oh, okay, right? yeah, yeah. What did they – like, what do they choose as their career? I want to sit in my apartment by myself, by myself typing. Right. Not going to be typing the best at connecting with people. made up things, like <laughs> typing things that came out of my imagination. So it's like that's a very, very different form of yeah. communication than being in front of a live audience Yeah, talking. yeah, yeah. So there are some novelists who are fantastic speakers, and I think that's a huge asset to their career. Yeah. But I would say more often they tend to be pretty, uh, pretty shy, at least yeah. until they, they become experienced with it. Right, right. Well, you, you started off speaking with high school students, you said? Or yeah, well, I would students? say I started started I mean, you really when you were in <laughs> yeah i started speaking at like hospital fundraisers like when mm-hmm. i had cancer that's how i lost my leg when i was like 10 and i kind of kept doing those for a few years and when i was 15 a motivational speaker came to my high school yeah and that's when i kind of realized oh this like this is a job that people do yeah and there's no reason why i couldn't do that job if i yeah. like, worked really hard at it and such so that's when I started getting like I wanted to actively find speeches. It wasn't just a yeah. couple times a year a hospital called me and asked. And how me. did that happen? Were you just in conversation as people were mentioning they had events coming up, or you would you would float your name out oh, there? Oh yeah, people? it was like, very active. You- I mean, I, you know, being a motivational speaker is a lot of people look at it and they're like, "Wow, that must be the best job ever," <laughs> and they're right. When you're they're, doing it, they're right. Once you once get you're started, on, yeah. Once what, and like once you're at the point in your career yeah. where people want you to speak, right now, it, and and that's where I am, and I'm very fortunate for that because it's a great job. Right. Yeah. But getting started as Ooh. a speaker is yeah. so hard. Oh, you're right. And I'm I'm lucky that I did that when I was 15, yeah. and I had tons of free time. I didn't know how hard it was going to be, yeah. and. I didn't have to make a living. Like yeah. sometimes people come to me and they're, you know, twenties, thirties, forties, and like, I want to I want to trans you know, I work in a normal five right. job and I want to become a motivational speaker. You're like, and okay. It's like, okay, cool. Here's how you do it. You need to give like a thousand speeches for free right. over the next two to three years. Yeah. And then you will with some talent and determination, you'll probably get good enough that people will start hiring you. Right. And they're yeah, like, yeah. okay, that's cool, but here's the thing. I have a job that I go to. Yeah. So like I can't I can't give the speeches like what's the shortcut? Right, yeah. Like what's the shortcut to just get there? And I'm like uh, maybe there's one. There's I don't no know about shortcut. it. Yeah. I I have not found it. So I'm lucky that I did that when I was 15, 16, 17. Yeah. When my parents were giving me food yes. and a place to sleep. Dude. So uh, I got through kind of all the free speeches then. And by the time I graduated high school. Yeah, schools were hiring me. That's fantastic. Yeah, and, but it, but yeah, getting started was so hard. It was like uh, to answer your original question. Yeah, it was it was a very a- active. I basically just started calling uh, middle school and high school principals, like just cold yes. calling hundreds of schools. And you know, my pictures like, "Hey, I'm Josh. I'm 15 years old, and I would like to speak to your students." And it, it did not go well. Uh, like, and and I think they were right, probably, to hmm. not want me to speak. I like, I you know, I was I was young and inexperienced. I just wasn't good at but it. But some of them said yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Some of them said yes, and my first couple ones were horrible. Like my my first real talk at a school was a middle school. Yeah. And at that time, I was I, I thought like, oh, I didn't I didn't yet realize that I had a story to share. Ironically, yeah. like I thought, oh, if only I had a, a life story to share. <laughs> No joke. 
<laughs> no joke. I was like, if only I had a story like those other speakers do. That's fantastic. So I thought I didn't have much to say. So I, I, You're like, I'm going to have to go do drugs hardcore for, yeah. for a few years. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I need to hit rock bottom somehow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I recruited like two of my friends, and, and we would like we would do like sort of these tag team speeches. And so our first one was at a middle school, and I was going to do, I think it was like seventh grade and then eighth grade. And they after I did the seventh grade one, yeah. they canceled the eighth grade speech. Wow. They canceled it. That's like how that bad moment. it was. It was Dang, that bad. Dude. Yeah. So and I asked them, and they were like, yeah, we, we felt that, that your content was disturbing to our students. It was disturbing. Disturbing, right? So think about that. Ooh. Not only was I not motivating them, like their <laughs> lives were actually worse when they walked out of the room as a result of, of hearing my speech. Did you put that on speech. your website? Clark Middle School calls it disturbing. Yeah, disturbing. <laughs> So, yeah, it was, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I just didn't know what I was doing and I was just sort of a a bad imitation of Tony Robbins. But you know what, man, this is, I I feel for people who start later in life because the only way you can get good is you have to have the space to suck at it for a while. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. And I would say it must be even more difficult now with social media and video yeah, because uh, all those if you videos go, of you sucking are going to be out there. Right, they're going to live forever on yeah. YouTube. So, yeah, that's tough. It's a t- uh, and, and I, I would guess, I mean, it must be sort of similar in, in Magic, right? That, like, you do it for a long time before you get good at it. Is, yeah. Is there sort of a similar, um, long, like, sort of, like, S-curve of, like, effort, 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 and then finally, like, you're good at it and it could become your job potentially? Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I think with anything, anything you're going to do in front of people, you just have to have tons of experience doing it you know yeah. and, and i was lucky enough when i was a kid uh my parents took me to church and i got involved in like the leadership program at church okay. so like i would do anything they wanted me to do okay you know and got in front of people a lot i i laughed that church was my open mic but <laughs> yeah that's interesting <laughs> it's uh yeah. yeah i mean kind of a different route to take but yeah i think uh I think it's cool that you started by speaking to junior high and high school students because there are many incredible keynote speakers, motivational speakers that w- would die a thousand deaths if they went to a high school and had to talk today. Totally. Uh, yeah. And I, and I think you can see the difference in speakers who got started speaking to students right. as, like the way I did mm-hmm. because they – because, I mean, speaking – Having spoken to, at many different audiences, sizes, places, right. all that, I can say that like speaking to a thousand high school students at a school assembly at eight a.m. Yep. in a gym, oh, yeah. is about the hardest audience to hold. Yep, and if you can hold them, you can hold any audience. It's true. It and is so, absolutely like, true. That's a useful skill to have. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. Like I know I won't say like names, but like people who like invented motivational speaking. Yeah. Oh yeah. Were the top refuse. Schools, like not just school, but they do, won't talk to, to like younger people because right. they can't hold their attention. And, and it's because kids don't care about your credits. Oh, yeah, I don't, not I at don't all. care that you wrote a book. Like, yeah. They, my parents yelled at me on the way to school today, and my girlfriend wants to break up with me. And I got this test after this that I don't, I'm no, not prepared for. Why would I care what you have to say? Totally. Win that audience over. And then. Doing a after dinner, you know, at a corporate is no big deal. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Because like, yeah, adults will they will even if they're bored, they will at least sit there politely, right, and pretend to pay attention. Yeah. Whereas students, I mean, I think like the attention it's like ten second attention <laughs> yeah. span. If you don't say something hilarious, oh yeah, or or shocking or amazing physicality yeah. or something, it's like they will like talk to their friend. They'll pull out their phone. Yeah, uh, and. And so, yeah, so it's, it's a good, I think, training ground to learn, yeah, to learn how to, like, project a lot of energy yeah. and how to, like, keep, make, you know, make your material dense and, and interesting. Yeah. Yeah. How, have you had any, um, like, awful stage moments? <laughs> I know you did when you started, but, like, even recently have there been, I just had a terrible one, so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I need solidarity. Um, I'm sure or I anything think... go wrong that. Yeah, I mean. I've, uh, I mean, g- getting started, I definitely made a lot of bad choices, you know, for, the, for many, <laughs> many years. Oh, don't say my, that in front of people anymore. <laughs> my favorite example is that one time I spoke at a American Cancer Society fundraiser. Yeah. And 
I thought it would be cool to like thematically talk about how when I had cancer, I lost my hair and was really sad. And so to emphasize this point, right. I wore a bald head wig <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to my speech. Really? Yes, I kid you not. Mm. I wore a bald head wig at, at this speech. It was like a relay for life. You know, in front of like all these people that were in like grandstands oh in, my gosh. in a, 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 like a high school football field or yeah. something. And so my whole talk, I was talking a lot about like losing my hair and how it was so sad and all this. And then, and then I had this like moment that was supposed to be like my grand reveal at the end. I was like, so you're probably sitting there thinking like, Josh, like if you finish the chemotherapy, like why, why did you not like throw your hair back? And then I like whipped you off the head wig. And I was like, oh, I did. I have hair now. You Scooby Doo to man, and this like, is, Whoop. but it's like this is a relay for life where there are so many people who oh. have cancer now, right, and don't have hair. Yeah, and it's just like so ridiculously insulting, and oh, not there's man. just nothing redeeming about that choice. Oh, oh yeah, I just I just cringe at, at those sorts of <laughs> things that I thought like this. Uh, you know, I, I I literally would go into things thinking like this will change lives. You know, people people will walk. People will never forget this, and they probably didn't. But for not the reasons I was hoping. <laughs> oh, Isn't it crazy how sometimes when you're putting something together, it just sounds so good? Yeah. Whether it's a joke or a, a concept for a speech, that's different too, man. I've done that before, where you build the entire presentation around this concept. Yeah. And in the middle of it, you're like, "This is not a good idea." Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Yeah, and I feel like yeah. So I don't. I don't usually have disasters on that level. Oh, you know, I, just, I have speeches that that just won't. That don't hit. Yeah. You know, and and it's like uh, a lot of times it's just factors that are not part of my control. You know, like the way the room is. Or yeah. uh, I had one a speech earlier this year. Yeah, I was really bummed out. I just it was fine. I mean, people, you know, it's like you have a different perspective having done stuff in front of lots of audiences, like how well it can go. Yep. So. I think people walked out probably saying, this was a great speech. Like, right. I got a standing ovation. There was, like, lots of compliments. But in my mind, I was like, no, nah, mm. it wasn't great. Yeah. And, I, you know, it was because it was really late at night. It was young people. I was, like, two and a half hours into the program. Oh, dude. People needed to go to the bathroom. They were tired. They wanted yeah. to check their phones, etc. So it was, like, all those things were, like... To, the, to that point, before, like, five minutes before I got on stage, the MC came on, on stage and was like... Don't worry, everyone. We've got way more program for you. <laughs> and they booed. No. They booed. Yes. And that's, I was like, Man. oh, no. They're booing just at the idea that something is going to happen now. Yeah. So um, I'm amazed at how many event planners put things together as if they've never attended an event. Yeah, there'll be some weird choices. There's sometimes. some weird choices. Yeah. But, I, uh, are you able, when you have those moments where it doesn't go like you wished it would, are you able to pretty quickly let go of it or? Yeah. I mean, so, I, mean so, I was really bummed like that day and that night that yeah. had been a speech I had been, I had been particularly excited about yeah. doing. Uh, yeah. It was cool. It was an exciting, very well produced event in terms yeah. of like, the staging and stuff. So yeah, I was really bummed, but I, you know, that was in the middle of a really busy week. And I think it was like the next day I was flying to a different speech. Yeah. And so it was like, all right, well, that's the next one. That's you always know? good when you have another one coming yeah. up. Yeah. And I still look it back and I'm like, ah, that, that bums me out to think yeah. about it, but it didn't, it didn't devastate me. Yeah. You know, I think if I, if I had like five of those in a row, yeah. I'd be like, Hmm, Something like, is something's off, off <laughs> in my career right now. Yeah. You know, like people, uh, you know, people aren't, don't like this kind of speech anymore or I'm not doing it right anymore. Yeah. But you know, it's one every once in a while. I mean, the way I always say it is, you know, sometimes people will be like, how was your speech? And I'll be like, eh, it was average. Mm. And they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. What went wrong? And, and I'm like, well, by definition, on average, speeches have to be average. That's it's actually yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. a mathematic, like that's how averages work. Yeah. It, the average means it's mm-hmm. the middle. Uh, so, you know, like they can't all be top. Yeah top fourth quartile, like yeah, yeah. the top 25%. You're not topping the last one every time. Yeah, until... and by definition, if you do 100 performances, uh, 25 of them have to be the worst 25. They have to be the That's bottom true. 25%. That's true. So it doesn't necessarily make it better, yeah. but you're fooling yourself if you think every each performance can be the 
best one ever. I mean, yeah. and you know, you can't get that much better every time that each performance is the best one of your whole life. Yeah. Like, that's just not how it works. How I don't do you, know. What about for you? Does it, do yeah. you get bummed out or what was the, what was the bad one you had recently? If you oh, want to geez. describe any part of it. <laughs> well, it's funny because like, um, and not, I, I'm, I'm never, I'm, I'm never comfortable going like, Oh, I killed like, mm-hmm. and just because I, I've, I've had some good shows and you know, like you said, you always compare everything to those like, yeah. Oh, that one was great. Yeah. But, um, I was the other day listening to a friend's podcast and he was talking with another performer about how, uh, like they recently had a bad show and I thought, you know, I haven't had any really awful shows lately uh-huh. and I was driving to an event and that event was the worst one that I've had in like a couple of years. Oh no. And it was just, it wasn't, it wasn't, I, it wasn't like I got up and, you know, totally, you know, did something awful. It was just like, it was a lunchtime event it was in the the lunch room for the it was for a casino and it was uh, like their employee appreciation but all it was was like food happening and then me oh yeah so it's like you're trying to get people's attention but people are coming in and coming out and they're at round tables so half of their backs are toward you and yeah it's you know really cruddy pa so they can barely hear you and so you're having to talk louder than you want and it was i just was laughing because i was like I, I just was like getting you know getting a little too comfortable like oh I feel like I'm in a good groove right now and yeah. then had, had this awful moment but yeah but, and that's where it's it's you know it's inevitable that you're going to take that somewhat personally yeah but obviously it wasn't you I mean yeah. you might like I think I am better when the crowd is responsive and and everything's set up well and right. everyone's laughing and they're energized. Uh, and then I'm worse to the extent I feel like I'm losing them or they're, this yeah. isn't going well. Like I close up and mm. deliver maybe like less energy or value as an entertainer. But uh, overall, I think I'm pretty similar. Yeah. You know, like I, I was actually watching a video this week of two different stand up sets and kind of like comparing the same yeah, jokes. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I was actually editing, I ended up editing it. Two different performances together. Is this, this the one together. you posted yesterday, yesterday or the day before? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's so good. You're right. Uh, thank you. Uh, but the interesting thing for me was that the the second one of them, the laughs were very, very small. And mm. uh, the, the first one, like, the laughs were, were big. Yeah. And and so I thought, like, oh, like, I must have been way better in that performance. But watching the video, like, back to back, I was like, I was pretty similar. Yeah. Like, my facial expressions, even like su- like the timing of the jokes was so similar. Yeah, I could. I found that I could overlay, could overlay the audio them. of one on top of the other on and certain yet, bits of it. And I didn't do that. I just found I could. Uh, so I was like, well, yeah. Like I think I definitely was a little bit better when people were responding more. Like I was more open. I was yeah, happy. I was excited. Totally. And you can sense that. Yeah. But, but for the most part, it's not like the jokes are way different. It's more the context yeah. changed. And I think that's a somewhat helpful thing to keep in mind. Yeah. That it seems to me that a lot of a lot of what a lot of what you can't control a lot of what changes are the things you can't control. Yep. Like if you've done it for a while, the things that you can control you pro- are probably pretty consistent. Right. So it's that other part that you can't control. Yeah. That's what changes a lot. Right. And ultimately like what makes a really great show. Because also I look yeah. at the you know, I had a couple speeches this year that in my mind, like the, the, the word I always want to use uh, is transcended. And I mm. realize that's very like haughty and, no, and I love sort of to, I'm, to I'll say. I'll go there with you, dude. Uh, and, and, and they can't, but they can't all be like that. Right. I don't think because what I've re- even if, because, because it's the context I've realized, like I look at a couple, couple speeches this year, I would say like there's two that I was like walked away. I was like, that was there was something special that happened in that room. Yeah. Like for me and for the audience, I think everyone walked out thinking like that, yeah. that yeah. was really something. Mm. And then I thought about it and I'm like, but so what was different about those talks was, did I, did I work out before? Did I drink one and right. a half cups of coffee right. before? Yeah, yeah, did yeah. I like write my, yeah. and I was like, you know what? It was the context that was different. It was, it was where that group was, who yes. they were, yeah. what, you know, just everything about it, like sort of lined up right. to create that. It wasn't, it really wasn't me. It was that the situation happened to be perfect for, yeah. for sort of the meeting of that group 
and for myself. That's great. I, I don't. Th- I don't think there's. Maybe there is, but I don't. There's I don't no think there's a way formula. to engineer that. Experience. I need the room to be sixty-eight degrees. Yeah, I, you know, the, there's something special about approaching, whether you're doing a presentation or you're just going to an event. I've been trying to get myself into this mindset of saying. This moment, like these people in this room are probably never going to be together. This Mm, same group of people, like this is a moment in time that's never existed and it's never going to exist again where this exact group for this exact purpose are in this room. And it just something about that changes my mindset to not just do it like, oh, I do this all the time, but to really think about what does this group need? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I I don't know. I've just been trying to challenge myself in that way. How do you, how do you keep yourself staying fresh with maybe some presentation that you've done a number of times? Yeah. I would say that is something I worry about a lot Yeah, without having experienced it Mm -hmm. Or, or, or I, you know, I project into the future and, and, it's like a bad mental habit I have overall, I think, is trying to solve problems that don't exist. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. what about well, this hypothetical, yeah. terrible problem that could happen? Uh, and, you know, to some degree, that's an interesting evolutionary instinct yeah. that we have that keeps us alive, etc. But uh, it, it can certainly work against you. So, yeah, I worry a lot about becoming stale or becoming tired of telling my story. And I think it is it is not like a completely uh, out of out of the realm of possibility scenario because I feel like I've seen keynote speakers and probably you have too, where it's clear yeah. they've done this exact presentation a million They're times. flipping a switch. They're just dialing in. Yep. And it could st- it doesn't mean it's terrible. It can still be okay, yeah. but it's not going to be transcendent. Right. Well, like we can say that for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's something I think about a lot and uh, I've asked a lot of entertainers kind of over the years. I uh, We're growing up in church do you, do you ever know the uh, recording artist Michael W. Smith? Absolutely. Okay. So Friends I, are friends. Forever. Exactly. <laughs> so that song, Sorry, I'm, you I'm, know he has to play that song every day of his life that he's on the stage. He has to, and he has to do it for the rest of his life, right? Yes. We know that, and yeah. he knows that. Yeah. So I've always wondered about that. And by chance, in what year was this? Probably 2009. Yeah. I was backstage at this big arena event. Yeah. And I found myself in a green room with Michael W. Smith. Yeah. And I was like, this is my chance. Like, yeah, I'm going to ask, ask him. him. Yeah. So, so I did. So I was like, hey, like, I've, I've actually always wanted to ask you this one question. How, how do you play friends every show and, <laughs> and, and, you know, like, and be excited about it and, and deliver like a cool, like fresh feel? Yeah. And he said, you're right. Like, I do have to play that that song every time but he said for a lot of people in the room i know they've never heard the song hmm. and it's like i've performed it thousands of times ah, that's good but for them it's yeah. their first time hearing friends and yeah. i want them to have that experience oh that's good and that is a helpful thing to me and you know ask the same thing uh, I don't mean to sound like I have tons of famous friends. These no. are these are my brush encounters with with famous people that right. I've wanted to know this question because they yeah. they've done the material way more than I ever have yeah, yeah, or yeah, probably yeah. ever will have. Same question of uh, Marie Osmond. You heard of yeah, Marie yeah, Osmond? yeah. Oh, so yeah. she and her brother have been doing a Vegas show for now maybe six or seven years. Mm-hmm. Uh, they do it like seven, eight times a week. Yeah. And I saw it last year with my wife, Ashley, and it was fantastic. It was so, so good. Yeah. And these are not, it's not just that they've been performing this show for six or seven years. They're performing material that they recorded like as children. Right. They've been doing some of this material for yeah. 50 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And deliver an amazing show that's it's very interactive with the audience, like a, like the way a good magic show would be. Yeah. Which you can... You can't really fake whether you're winning over this person who you've brought onto stage. Right. Right. Like yeah, you yeah. have to actually interpersonally win them over. Yep. And I, I was just amazed. And, uh, and I have like a friend through Children's Miracle Network who was interviewing her for her podcast. And she was like, Josh, do you happen to have any questions for Marie Osmond? I was like, do I? Uh, <laughs> so, so uh, she asked on the podcast and Marie Osmond said like the exact same t- thing. That really? This, Focusing on the... That for them, this is the first time. This is the first time they've seen the show. Ah. And I was like, that's so, so that's something that I, I think about definitely uh, is, okay, this is the first time for these people and probably the last time for most people that they will hear this story, like this, uh, this particular anecdote. Yeah. I think that I, 
as a precaution, I, I do try to like always be developing new things and asking myself, okay, I've told this story a lot, but what are the tweaks I can make? Like mm. what, like, even if it's a, a story I, I, I have really down to like what I think is the best version of it, are, is there an extra sentence or an extra, yeah. like even, you know, just a look or a pause that I think could make right. it better. Uh, I definitely like think about those, those things as, cause to me it's like, I don't know if you're always, if you're always challenging yourself to get better, it almost seems like by definition, you're not burned out on it. Yeah. So I also think that if I got to a point where I got tired of a, a certain part of my speech, I would, I would start, I would just not do that part anymore. Right. Um, like I said, that's more of a problem I worry about for the future. Uh, yeah. But I, but I think as a motivational speaker, especially that's important. Yeah. You know, you have to be, you have to be thinking about, I just think that as a speaker, as a speaker, especially maybe as a, as a musician, mm-hmm. yeah, the song could still sound the same. It, it wouldn't be quite as good. Right. But it's like as a motivational speaker, it's it's almost like by definition, right. you have to be grateful to be there and happy yeah. to be there oh, yeah. to be able to deliver the emotions that that people are hoping for from you. I had uh, an experience recently at an event that I was uh, emceeing where a, a speaker who they've made movies about, like, and I just, I mean, you see this, the books and the movies and you would think, this guy's got to be the most grateful, like, loving, <laughs> down-to-earth person. And he came up to do sound check and was just miserable to everybody. Huh. And, um, and it just, there's something about that. I feel like, as a speaker, as a motivational speaker, there's a responsibility. Do you know what I mean? Like, as an entertainer, you must be entertaining. As a motivator, you have to... You have to really believe in who you are and what you're saying. You can't get to that point where you're just phoning it in. Yeah. Because I think people feel it. I think people definitely feel it. Ah. And that's like that's what they'll notice yeah. and say afterwards. And, you know, if professionally, if you are like in a scenario like the person you're describing where you've had movies made about you and, and such... Which is to say, if you're famous, people will still hire you because you're famous. Yeah. But so, yeah, you could sort of make a living at it, but you're not being effective at it. Like nobody's right. walking away like, wow, that like that really touched me or made me think about something in a new way. Right. They're walking away and be like, we saw a famous person in real life and, uh, you know, we saw a famous person in real life. Yeah. Like that's what they're saying. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. And and meeting planners do talk to each other. And mm-hmm. I mean, I, as a speaker, I often hear from people like, oh, so-and-so, like... <laughs> He's the worst backstage. Yeah. Everybody talks about that. Yeah. So, so I think you also, you do harm yourself professionally too. Oh, uh, totally. Not to mention you are just like not delivering what, what you could do. You know, yeah. it, it seems like, I don't know, I guess you could, you could be at a point where it's like, I don't really like giving, like, I don't like it at all, but I'm famous and they hire me and they pay <laughs> me a lot of money. So, so maybe, but it's like, why well, miss out on the chance to like make an impact on people. It seems right. like that's, that's what that's what every human being wants is to like beyond being, having clothing and shelter and stuff. Like if you're, if you live in the first world, probably you're towards the top of Maslow's hierarchy and yeah. where we find that sort of actualization and fulfillment mm. is largely by impacting people. Yeah. And so if you have the chance, if you have the privilege of being in front of people, of being on a stage, it's such a, it's such a waste yeah. to, to not, be grateful for that and, and try to bring people something positive, you know, yeah. something like con- making things a little bit better for them. Uh, what, yeah. What, what a waste to, yeah. to, you know, to miss out on that, on that opportunity. Oh, that's so good, man. That's friggin' encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> you should be a motivational speaker. Okay, okay. That? <laughs> yeah. What I mean, okay. uh, I know we started at the beginning by talking a little bit. I mean, we haven't even gotten into like your athleticism and all the things that you've done, but like <laughs> just all, all my all my theories about uh, performance entertainment. I love are, it. But they're my favorite things to talk about. Really, it's <laughs> well, like, these are the things that like people come to me after the speech and they're like, uh, yeah. Well, it's like my favorite when I spoke to the National Speakers Association. Maybe oh, 10 yeah. Years ago. It's like the trade industry. Totally, yeah. speakers. And the compliments people gave afterwards were like the most meaningful compliments to me yeah. personally. What were they? Well, because instead of uh, after a normal show, a lot of people say like, your story was so inspiring or like, yeah. I love how you talked about this, which is great. Like, I'm not, it's like, that's kind, but I'm obviously not up there thinking about 
how awesome is my story? Like, right, right. right. Uh, I'm thinking about how I'm sharing that story. And right. So at National Speakers Association, people came up literally things like your diction, amazing. <laughs> Or, or your cadence. People were like, the cadence was fantastic. I Love loved it. your cadence. Yeah. And it was cool because I was like, thank you. I think about the cadence. Or like, I, I, try, I, like, I, I try to do the diction right. So, See, well, these are the things that people who come up to you and say your story was so impacting. The reason it landed yeah. for them was because you're putting in the work – yeah, on your cadence and your diction and your like time. To, I like to think pace. so. Like, yeah, you know what I mean. So it's oh, good for people to get who get that to understand it. You know. Yeah, totally. So, which is just to say, <laughs> like, like those are the things that I'm thinking about, which is like what we've yeah. talked about for the past hour. I'm not like sitting around all day thinking like, wow, like remember that time when I had cancer and lost my leg? Yeah. Like, I don't like think about. It's it's weird because that's what I talk about on stage, right? And so that's that's just a weird part of the of the job where I. It's hard sometimes – I get that people might walk away thinking that having one leg is a much bigger deal than it is mm. because so much of my material relates to that. Right. The reason it does is because that's what people are interested in. And I'm okay with that. Right. I, I don't mind talking about it and sharing with it. It's not like I'm – oh, like this is so boring or something. But in my everyday life, I'm not – thinking about it that much. Right. But, it, but you know what I'm saying? Like you could walk away from a keynote that was an hour and be like, wow, like this guy must think about having one leg and all the time, his battle yeah. with cancer from 20 mm, years ago I all the time. Saying, yeah. I don't actually. Yeah. It's almost like ironic, like that I, uh, that that's sort of maybe the public image that people might take. Right. Nothing wrong with that. But in reality, what I'm thinking about is my diction and my cadence yeah. and should I describe myself as an entertainer or performer <laughs> and how can I make transcendent speeches like those are the things that I, I think about and I'm yeah. passionate about yeah. and then, do I need to change up the intro because am I setting myself exactly, up exactly exactly you know? are people feeling sorry for me yeah so uh, <laughs> it's like those are those are the things but like you said what you know you're delivering the story but it's it's yeah. how you deliver it yeah whether people realize it or not that ultimately determines whether it it connects with them yeah like like what you're saying with magic right like it's like yeah you could like you can do the 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 rings yeah and you can be awesome at it based on the way that you bring it like based on the way you deliver it yeah and people will come up to you afterwards i bet like to doc and be like the rings are so great that's an amazing trick right but they don't realize what they loved about it was doc they loved yep. the way he did the rings yeah you know and you as a magician that's what you would compliment mm. you know you would compliment the things that other people don't notice right like oh i love the variation you did in the rings how right. you used five instead of three mm-hmm. and, and the way you did this joke there was was brilliant ah so good dude <laughs> What are you looking forward to? Like, I know that you're in a good season right now and you're, you're busy with speaking opportunities and all of that. But I mean, you've, you've written, you've done, you're doing stand up now. You've done, you know, inspirational, motivational speaking. Is there anything that you feel comfortable talking about that's like <laughs> on that list of like, I want to do this that you're looking forward to? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And uh, <laughs> well, it's a funny question because it's an inevitable Thing that people want to know from a motivational speaker, like at a speech, you yeah. know, people are always like, "Cool, you talk about goals, but like, what's, what's your, your goal? goal?" Yeah, and uh, and it's like, ha- if my goal, if I'm like, my goal is to uh, improve my diction slightly <laughs> over the next twelve months, which might genuinely be my goal, like the thing I care about the most, it's just not inspiring. They're like, "Oh, like we <laughs> wanted you to go to the Olympics in a different sport. That's what we were hoping for." <laughs> so. It's like, it's tricky. Like sometimes my goals are like not, not as inspiring as people would hope. I love it. Um, but yeah, I, I think, <laughs> I think that, uh, um, the, the comedy is, is just, yeah, that's kind of the thing that I'm, I'm into right now and, yeah. and into exploring. Like I do want to continue to get better as a speaker and I have an idea of like the, the sort of groups that I most like to speak to and I would want, I want to speak to more and the, yep. and the, the parts of the speech and the, the elements of being a person who does that on stage that I want to improve. But the most maybe tangible thing is I really like doing comedy. I'm not sure if it would ever become a part of my career per se, yeah. but I find that it really contributes to my day job as a speaker yeah. because sometimes, you know, I could, there are jokes that I develop and have done at the comedy club that 
I'm like, yeah, I'm probably going to do that yeah. that joke in my speech this weekend. Right. And so it definitely it, it sharpens you in in that sense and gives you like sort of new material right. and uh, maybe in confidence in front of different types of audience, sometimes more challenging audiences than you would get at, right, yeah. uh, from a corporate group. Yeah. And it's nice to have those outlets. I mean, part of why I've jumped on and done grab bag and. Uh, this next week I'm doing Scott Neary's Booby Trap. Oh, nice. Uh, what a great show. Have you been to it? so fantastic. So cool. I love it. It's yeah, like it's awesome. It's it's like the castle in that it gives you... I feel like it's one of those environments where you just go, I'm going to shut it all off and I'm just going to enjoy. Like it's I'm going to have a Santa Claus yeah. moment and think... I mean, they're like, okay, move the chairs. And then someone lowers from the yeah, ceiling and does yeah. a circus act. And you're like, yes! Yeah. it's Life is magic. It's such, <laughs> it's such a fun show. Oh, it's so cool. So, but I mean, part of, part of what I love about these environments is it gives performers who, you know, it gives you an opportunity to play a yeah. little bit into, like, some of that stuff that you came up with doing that show, you wouldn't have necessarily been able to free flow when you're getting hired to give a totally a speech yeah, and you, you know <laughs> I've got to deliver so I have to do what I know is solid totally yeah you, there's not a lot of room for <laughs> for bombing <laughs> right like, yeah it's, it's yeah. Fine. like and I, yeah I did a I did a stand up comedy class through Rad. West Side recently awesome how was it uh, it was awesome and it, it's basically like uh, an op- a struct- like an open mic that you're guaranteed time oh yeah because you like paid to be in the class that's great so and it, so like that to me that was like such a safe environment to fail in. Dude. Because it, it, you know, it's like, yeah, you don't want your jokes to fail, but it actually doesn't matter. Right. So even at an open mic, there might be people there that you want to impress. Let's yeah. say if it's a public event. But in a class, it, it just is yeah. totally fine. And it's expected. You're, you are explicitly there to develop new material. Yeah. So that, that was to me like a, such a great experience. And I, oh yeah, I want to do another one because it was, it was such a safe space to just try material and like maybe some of it worked great. Yeah. And then that's then, and then like I, I did, yeah, like there was a joke that, you know, I, I tried there for the first time. It worked great. So I did the West Side Comedy. Worked yeah. well there. I'll probably, I'll probably put in my speech this weekend. It might, it might become like a thing that's I great. do all the time forever. Isn't uh, that crazy? The one never, never possibly come to you. Had right. You not or been in that environment. I would have been afraid to try it in right. front of like an important paid gig right. yes. where I don't, you know, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't want to like take, if they've paid me to be there for 60 minutes, I don't want to do five minutes of, of testing material yeah because that that seems unfair to them right and there yeah and there's a responsibility you know you've you've got an agreement that you're going to provide this experience and you need to do what you know is going to do that yeah Yeah. but i'm a huge proponent of like taking classes i'm doing um ucb improv oh nice and i've been doing that for a couple years and i just love it i mean i'm not i'm probably never gonna try to go out to be an improviser as a career but i don't know that anyone makes money improv but (laughs) it's unclear (laughs) But it's been so – it's so freeing to just get in a room with people that you don't know and just create an environment where you're free to experiment and play and figure out yeah. you know, what yeah, you Yeah, I find. should do an improv class. That's I probably, think you dig that's it, probably what, what should be my next, oh, my next so goal. Fun. <laughs> it's so fun. Well, man, thank you for doing this. We're, can't, we're, looking, we're like an hour and 20 into this almost. This is incredible. Yeah, I'm amazed if anyone's still listening. Thanks. Yeah, well, we've only got four hours left. <laughs> just joking. How, how can people get a hold of you, man, if they want to follow along and, and see all that you're doing or they want to have you come out to do a, a presentation? How do they, how do they yeah. reach out? So um, if you Google Josh One Leg, I'm the number one result. That's, <laughs> that's my proudest accomplishment. Did and, you, now, was that, did that just happen or was that like... Did you oh, play, it, do you have? It like wasn't like SEO. Com? I was yeah, trying to see, win. Yeah, listen, guys. Uh, like, <laughs> there's I really a lot of competition. Win is Josh one leg. There's a lot of Josh one there's legs. A, there's this guy in Poughkeepsie who's trying to take me. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, what I'd like to win is like motivational speaker. Right. <laughs> That's a really competitive one to win. Uh, so right now I win Josh one leg. Uh, but yeah, my n- last name is Sunquist. So S U N D Q U I S T. So on. All social media, I'm at Josh Sunquist. My website awesome. is joshsunquist.com. You can, from there, you can find any of my social information about my speeches and my books and whatever I'm, I'm up to in the future date at which your listeners are consuming this podcast. So good, man. Thanks. I can't thank you enough for doing this. Thanks I, for having me, man. This, this, this is super fun. It was not a, a selfish uh, thing, but I'm leaving here more motivated and encouraged. And, you know, just because it's who you are, bro. Thanks, You're man. the real deal. Thanks, Go man. check out Josh. Go follow him. And uh, you also put out some freaking hilarious videos. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. That I love beyond the stand up stuff. Like, you just guys got to go check it out. <laughs> Follow them on YouTube and Insta and all that stuff. But I'm going to turn this off. We can keep chatting, but go check out Josh. Thanks, Sarah.